people for coming. I'm uh, really excited for today's speaker. So he, uh, he has experience as a communications director. Currently, he works for Berkeley Food Collective as a communications. Sorry, Berkeley Food Institute. Uh, uh, for uh, as a communications director, he has been communications director for Hyperloop as well. He, he's also the president and CEO of EAC Enterprises. Uh, a media and branding consultancy. He's done music production and event production, and he's played, fun fact, he's played piano on screen and in studio for uh, ABC Studios, Disney and ABC Studios. So if you could please give him a warm welcome to Edmund Altman. <laughs> um, really briefly, how many of you have, have started your own businesses already? What industry? Uh, it's tech nonprofit. Okay. How many of you are planning really quickly to start your own? How many of you? How many of you have parents who have started to run their own business? Okay. So I wanted to do this since the time I was very young, and I, you know I'm going to just going to give you some overview about what I've gone through and, and what my path is. It's a little bit different, and I hope I don't bore you, um, but I'll I'll try to be you know give you some some points that I think. You might be able to learn from. Certainly, I did. Um, I wanted to start all sorts of businesses when I was a kid. Anything. I didn't care. I wanted a paper route. I wanted fixed bicycles. I took my dad's electronics apart and you know tried to mess with that and got in trouble for not knowing how to put things back together. And my mother would always say, "Stop trying to take people's money." And that wasn't necessarily the most positive thing, but she was just worried that I was getting into things that I didn't quite understand. Um, I was a little brat of a kid. I started college at 10 years old at Mount St. Mary's College. Um, and I started as a musician because I had a, a great talent for it. Um, the things I liked were, were music and electronics and architecture. So I learned how to draft. Um, and I was trying to build little buildings and thought I might go into that profession. I never did. But um, that's sort of the, the beginning of my life. Let me ask you this. Did any, has anybody seen the, um, the Google Doodle for today? Okay, there's a reason I mentioned this one. It's oh, the guy by the name of Omar Sharif has passed away. You probably don't know him. He was an actor. If you've ever seen uh, Lawrence of Arabia or any of those old films that go in that direction, he's one of the stars of that. I'm going to just tell you what he did, and I'm going to tell you later on why that's important. He, he uh, was from Cairo, graduated with a degree in mathematics and physics. His father had an exotic wood sales shop, so they did very high-end hotels and homes. He went to work for his dad and then became an actor. So you see that diversity, but it drove him in a very special manner. We'll talk about that later. Um, so my first... I told you about what, what happened with me when I was young, but my first business, what prompted me as a musician? I was, I was already a soloist when I was 14, 15 years old, um, classically, on the clarinet and on the piano. And I decided, well, I was learning these things about contracts from lawyers that said, oh, you're you know, a fun little kid, let me teach you this and teach you that. But I got it. I understood it. I would sit down and read. I'd ask my mom to take me to the library, and I'd study more so I could keep up with these things that nobody my age was supposed to keep up with. And I decided when I was 17, 18 years old, and I was trying to figure out college, um, that I would start my own business, my own consultancy for musicians. And I was going to do contracts, and I was going to help people get record deals, and if somebody got sued, I was going to help them with that. I had one attorney. I knew his son, and the, his son didn't want to work in the law office, so he said, well, you come on in. And he let me have an office in there, so I was a skinny little kid with four attorneys telling me what to do and how to do it, teaching me what I needed, needed to know about IP. Started a successful business. During the process, I had another guy named Gordon Simmons, who was an older gentleman who had worked for NSA, the National Security Agency, um, during, at the end of World War II. And he was assigned, there were, there were two guys who were Buddhists, who were jailed, who, would, who refused to give up their philosophy. And one died in prison. He was assigned by the US government to watch what was going on with them. Um, and learned a lot about you know, how to move people from one country to another. He was part of that law office and showed me how to do visas for artists. Another bit of knowledge, another talent. I put that in my pocket, I didn't use it, 
not straight away. So by the time I got to grade school, now I was more interested in, in stuff that had to do with the industry that I had started in, with music. So what does that come to you? If you're doing albums, you have what? You have graphics, right? Photography. I'm still, I guess I'm okay with photography now. I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I've been pushed to do more while I'm here, and it's turning out pretty good because I learned the basics of what I needed to know, and I've been able to apply that here. But I started looking for these different elements that I could combine into one package, and it seemed to work out pretty well. Musicians, consultants, as that business was called, was still going. The attorneys had moved from 1210 Wilshire over to the larger building, the Wells Fargo building near downtown Los Angeles. That's where I was born and where I grew up. Um, and so I continued on my own. I, I kept my license up in the city of LA. I didn't incorporate. I was scared of it. I didn't know what a corporation was going to do to me or for me. But I knew I could easily get a business license in the city of LA and, and operate. I wasn't going to go to any other place, really. I didn't have to have an office in any, any other spot. People could come from wherever they were to me in LA, and I could do business with them. So that worked out fine. Got a bank account, made a little money, put some money in there. Um, but as I got more interested in, in branding, I met a gentleman who is now, um, he was NAB, te te uh, the National Association of Broadcasters, you know that this particular nomenclature his name. They have different awards in different states. They have a national award and they have awards in different states. And this gentleman, Meredith, won that award in Texas. And a little bit after that, he was awarded um, the Bill and Melinda Gates grant to go teach what he knew about broadcasting in Kenya. And that expanded to other countries on the continent of Africa. Meredith and I stayed in touch and we continued. We started very early and stayed in touch all these years. But he started off with a magazine called Blue Note. And from Blue Note, he went to Motown Records. And he dragged me along because, and this is, I think, an important thing to remember, I had learned all these things that I told you about when I was very young. And they had these professionals who were supposed to be trained in all these tasks who couldn't produce the product. So he asked me to come in and work on a couple of products for Motown, a couple of album covers, some sleeves, we actually wound up selling a project. We wanted to see how good we were at this. We sold a record project without them even hearing the music. So there was nothing recorded. There was zero music done. There were two songs written. It was, and you can find this. It's called The Good Girls. They did one album and they broke up, like so many other groups. But it was fun for us to learn how to pitch. It was fun for us to learn how to put together a marketing package, um, have all the collateral necessary to fit in, sit in front of Busby, who was president of Motown at the time, and said, you've got to have this, and make them believe just by our passion and our ability to craft words that they were listening to something. And they could have sworn they heard some songs. They didn't hear a damn thing. So we continued forward from there. Meredith went on to Electra. I went on to performing more. Um, I went around the world with that. Now, why is that important? Because you notice I'm jumping around a lot in my life. I don't have one path. Because I had started university so early, I was pretty much of a brat when I got into, I went to Loyola University. Um, and the first year, I'll give you an example, my philosophy class, I was asking so many crazy questions that the professor didn't like, he said, Mr. Allman, I will give you a C if you just never come back to my class and I don't want to see you on campus anymore. So I was curious. He wanted to get through his course material. I was disruptive in that sense. So that gives you an idea of where my head was. I wanted to learn as much as I could. I, I, I spent as much time as I could at tasks or in library learning everything possible to feed my desire to be entrepreneurial. So, um, where was I? I lost, I lost, I lost my place a little bit. Let's, um, but anyway, so I took, taking all that stuff that I'd learned, I had to then begin to apply it to myself. You have any artists that you really like that kind of don't do that well, but they're really cool and just keep going anyway? You catch them on Spotify or you, you might catch some of their stuff on SoundCloud. 
You ever heard of a guy by the last name of Bonamassa? Anybody ever heard of him? Probably nobody. He's a blues, you have? Yeah. He's got an interesting story. He learned these tasks. He learned how to market himself. New age of internet, he learned how to use Facebook and Twitter and everything. And was making half a million dollars with no record company, with no real tour, with, no, with a couple people helping to manage his career. Um, so the point is, you're learning these tasks that help you be entrepreneurial. You're applying them. And you have to begin to apply them to yourself first. There are a lot of um, CEOs, well, let's just say C-suite generally, who don't know how to apply this stuff to themselves. They're very smart. They're very capable. They've learned everything about law, everything about engineering, whatever you need to know. <coughs> so they can go through the motions of running a company, but they are not Branson. They are not, uh, what's his name that runs uh, T-Mobile? Oh, come on, you guys have to do some of this. <laughs> what is his name? I forgot his name. Anyway, it's funny to see pictures of him when he was very clean cut, very corporate, starting his business, doing what he thought he had to do, and all of a sudden, he says, forget this, it's not working. He grows his hair long, he puts on a pink shirt, says T-Mobile, he always wears a pink shirt, he wears crazy tennis shoes, he puts on a black jacket over that, and he creates this other persona. He began to apply everything he had learned as a marketer to himself. And that energy spanned out to everybody in his company, and now you have T-Mobile. And there's a, there's a whole other story in that that I'll, actually, let me tell you that story now. Um, the beginning of your phone, you hear a ring, right? That's called a ring back tone, okay? There's a gentleman from Germany, Carl invented a platform that would put messages on the front of your phone. So you, instead of hearing a ringtone, you hear maybe a short news story. If you want to hear more, press five, you press a button, and it will either cache the information for you so you can hear it later, or you could hear it right away, and the phone call would pause, okay? Um, the gentleman, Jean Legere, is that, his, is that how you say his name? I, anyway, I don't remember, but anyway, he wanted this technology himself, got close to Carl, somebody else stole it. Carl actually took this to court. You never take a patent to court. You know, a patent, they always say a patent is only as good as the money you have to protect it, but Carl sued, cost him about $6 million, went up against James Baker, who used to be Secretary of State, with his team of people, that was about $22 million worth of lawyer's fees, and Carl won. So now they've been sitting on this, probably this year they'll begin to use it, um, I know in Turkey they already use that as a marketing tool. I know it sounds kind of crazy. We're going through all this stuff about invasive marketing. That's a little bit more invasive than you'd ever want to hear something at the beginning of your call. But it's useful. Governments tend to use it if they need to for emergency notices in Africa, Turkey, and India. It's not quite caught on because of that patent issue, but they'll release it. I'm the first person in the Western United States, in the, in the Western Hemisphere of the world, I should say, to actually do programs for that. So I did a news program, you hear my voice on that. Um, I don't know if the company's still going, Carl was talking about folding it, but the technology is robust. So, John, well, anyway, I don't remember his name. But he was always aware of these different things, these different technologies, but because of who he is, because of how he branded himself, he was able to get close to different people, and get the technology he needed to keep this little company ready. Okay? Um, so that's a, like a little side story. Let me continue on some more stuff that, that I dealt with. Um, as I was learning how to be a marketer, be a communications person, I worked for a couple of uh, office planning companies, um, and that was just how do you get a product into somebody's hands and get them to continue to use it. All sales. Then I went off to, um, you've seen these, you, you, maybe you've seen them, they're trying to bring them back, these click clack balls, two little things on a string, and pluck, 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 just silly little pastime. Um, there's a gentleman named Chuck Howard that started a toy company, and because of how I had learned to apply some of these things to myself personally, and present myself in a certain way, he says, you know what, you might be good for my company. I'd like to take you on 
and I'll teach you some stuff. So he taught me about plastics. He taught me about molds. He taught me a lot about banking, getting loans for businesses. Um, and he taught me about what happens when the government comes and shuts you down because they say your toy can hurt people. So <laughs> that little thing, those two little balls at the end of these strings pretending to explode and hurt folks. So he got shut down really quickly. And I learned something valuable from him. If you, I mean, what would you do if you had a company like that shut down? You're making all this money, hand over fist, whammo, the toy company's talking to you about taking over and paying you off. And suddenly the government says, you can't. What would you do? Okay. Somebody else, give me an answer. What do you think? What would you do? Change the product a little bit. Okay. Chuck went, screw it. I'm going to go to something else. I'm going to use my same mold maker. I'm going to do a whole different thing. He went to a segmented jump rope. It sounds silly, but people at that time were starting to get into fitness, and they didn't have a really easy way to get a rope that would be durable that they could cut down to size. So he put nylon inside, put, the, put these plastic extruded tubes around it, different colors so it was fun, and sold that to Wamo instead. And then he sold his company. So he taught me a lot about pivoting. I learned pro probably the most important thing from that is how to be agile. And you hear that term a lot in business now. People talk about, well, we've got to be agile. We have to be able to do this. Agility means having a business, having a purpose, but finding other things that will meet that purpose. So that was that. Um, am I doing OK so far? Am I boring you? Anybody want to break in with a question or two at, at this point, even early? No? OK, I'll keep going. Um, so after that, after the manufacturing, I went back again to my music. That's still my love. Okay. Um, and I'm going to mention something else about music later on. But suffice it to say that that's what I started in. That's what I grew up in. And everything I learned from marketing, graphics to support it, messaging, print, how to write, how to do interviews of musicians, how to, how to do my own bio like I was doing an interview of myself, all became because I was working in that particular industry. But I could branch out and use it in other industries. So now, I'm starting to see a divergence. I'm saying, okay, I could do all this stuff in music. Because of the stuff I did when I was a kid playing around with electronics, I had learned audio engineering as well. And now everybody's looking at me going, you're crazy. Why don't you just settle down and do one thing? And I couldn't. I didn't want to. But I think with the people that I know, and I'll insert this here now, um, there's a gentleman named Nolan Bushnell who started Chuck E. Cheese, and he started Atari, and now he's doing a lot of AI work. He's got eight children who are all adults, and they're all doing brilliant work with him. And he, he never sat still. He gave Steve Jobs his first job. He had to give Steve Jobs a job because he slept on his door and didn't take a bath and said, I'm not going anywhere until you give me a job. So that was Steve Jobs' first work, working for Atari Games, for, with Nolan as his boss. And Nolan is in his 80s now, he never knew Nolan. And he just never gets bored. He's always curious about everything around him. Um, and he, he looks at me and says, you know, my, my, my uh, launch ramp is not as long as yours. You know, I'm, I'm up there in years. He says, well, I don't know, that doesn't stop me. He doesn't care. He keeps going and going and going. That's another part of that agility factor that I was talking about. The ability to stay curious. The ability to have, if you have a corporation, be able to have divisions. Be able to say, well, we're doing this well. Is there something else related that I can bring into this and have some fun with? You can make a good deal of money and still enjoy yourself. About that time, I'm looking at, so I, I learned about manufacturing, I knew about music, I'm starting to learn about film a little bit, you know, scoring films. All that stuff takes money. And if you don't know the banking system, you don't know what you're doing for your cash flow. You don't know what you're doing to finance. You've got to know how much money you have, what you can do with it. You've got to know how much money somebody else has and how much they want to screw you. Venture capitalists are not the easiest persons to work with. Or how do you make money? Or how do you start a product and make money from that and then 
get rid of it and come back and finance one, something that you really want to do? You know, how hard do you want to work? Maybe you're fortunate. Maybe you have one path. You know that's the only thing you want to do. You can stay on that path. But I will guarantee you the other things I just mentioned earlier are going to apply to this one path that you're on. You still have to learn all that stuff. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I had gone to Guitar Center to look at some more equipment that I couldn't afford. And I met this gentleman at the hot dog stand next door. And now mind you, remember what I said about marketing myself, knowing how to dress? Even if it's simple, you can do a t-shirt. But knowing what to put on, having it be your brand, having it be part of you. So I had on what I needed to have on to show me as me. And this gentleman named Bruce Stoller was having a hot dog next to me. And he just, that energy was interesting to him. So he asked me a few questions. Turned out Bruce was running a place called Wilshire Investments. There's now an index called the Wilshire, I think it's the Wilshire 5000 now. He invented that. So this gentleman looks at me and says, what are you doing? I told him about the company ideas that I've had, where I was now, with this new production company, what I wanted to do. He said, you need financing. Boom. I had met somebody. Now, this is another important thing. I had met somebody who was going to teach me the next thing I needed to know, but I also met somebody who was a mentor to me. So now I have an important figure who I can follow in the, in the public eye, but I could also walk into his office. He'd go, okay, sit down. He'd give me an empty chair. He'd sit me in his office, and I'd listen to all these people trade. I learned a little bit about stocks. I learned a little bit about commodities. I learned a whole lot about Reg A, Reg D, and other types of corporations, other types of offerings. If you have a corporation, how do you want to get financed? How much stock do you want to sell? How do you divide that up? How do you keep your interest? Um, what kind of people do you talk to when you're selling your stock? Do you want to have that and have another company that's another division below that that you can be happy in that you can run and let somebody else play here? Maybe you spin that division off later on. You have your own company. You're playing with whatever you started. Taught me all about these things. Having a mentor, as, as you begin to figure out how you want to focus, having a mentor is probably one of the most important things you can do. You know who Michio Kaku is, the physicist? Japanese gentleman with white hair, about down to here. Does a lot of speaking. Um, there's, there's him and who's the other gentleman? I think of this one, the other physicist. Michio says, I knew I needed a mentor. Because my teachers were teaching me a lot of good stuff, and I was smart and I could absorb it, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I was trying to be a theoretical physicist. I wasn't trying to be an engineer. So I read everything I could about Einstein, and he literally modeled his life after Einstein. He says, he started here at this age doing this, I will do that. He started, he did this here at this point in his life, I will do the same thing. And now, He's living his life doing a lot of speaking, doing a lot, doing a lot of television. He's a very interesting person. He does a little bit of work for NASA. He's enjoying himself tremendously. He lives in New York and, and teaches there. So that mentor is going to be very important to you. If I had to ask, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask this question generally, and let's see if anybody has somebody who's a mentor to you who really excites you. Anybody? Oh. What about you? Yeah. Anybody who's a mentor to you? Anybody who you follow? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Not exactly. Not really. Not exactly. So tell me this. I'm going to I'm going to use you as a little guinea pig right now. What do you? You're graduating this year? No. No. I'm a junior right now. Okay. What is your focus of study? Uh, cognitive science. Okay. What do you want to do with that? Not exactly sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So so here's the deal. You could go and work for somebody else. You could have your own entity, right? You could partner with other people. You could find some innovation that's only you. You could find an innovation that's you and others collectively. So you have a number of paths you can go. And we all have that same thing no matter what it is. You know, I have, I have friends of mine, my brother-in-law decided as a trombonist, I can't do much, I'm only playing the trombone. Well, he went to work for Neil Diamond and he went to work for um, Phil Collins and he went to work for Tom Jones in Las Vegas. This has got these wonderful jobs all at the same time, flying all over the world doing this stuff. So he stayed with one thing, working for somebody, and owns property up and down California. 
So that was something that he wanted to do. That was a goal for him. He didn't want to be entrepreneurial. He didn't want to branch out. He just wanted to do that one thing. And he's happy doing it. He's very good at it. Okay. It could be the same thing with somebody who's a doctor. Okay. Let's suppose you want to go into medicine. The time commitment is extreme. But when that's what you want to do, you stay with it. You stay on that path. And you find a way to be good. And you find a way to be patient. And in the end, when you're finished with everything you have to do academically, you can start your own practice. You can be a part of a hospital. You, can, you still have those same choices. You can be entrepreneurial, or you can work for somebody. Okay. Is it? Would I be safe to say that most people here are thinking maybe entrepreneurially? Yeah. You, you've got. You're nodding your head like maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But that excites you. There's something about that freedom that's important to you. Yeah. Right. Would I be accurate if I said most people your age, more than people my age, and I'm not going to tell you how old I am, no, <laughs> are more willing to go after that freedom, have more courage? Would that be an accurate statement? Okay. So, going back to that idea of having a mentor, that's going to be one of the most important things you do. Butter somebody up. You know, you're just, I, I just admire, I just, I want to learn from you, and can I shadow you, and can I just have coffee with you on a Wednesday or whatever. Find somebody you can listen to, who can teach you what you want to know. Otherwise, you're going to make mistakes. What happened with me with all these things I did? I gained a lot of knowledge, but I flew off the cliff, parachute didn't open. Get back up, jump off the cliff again, parachute didn't open. I went through a lot of learning. I went through a lot of trial and error. And I did have good mentors. I had excellent mentors in music. I had excellent mentors in finance. I had excellent mentors legally. But life's too short to take all of those as a, as a major and go through college three times. You've got to study. You know how much it takes to go through and, and study what you're studying, and then you have, what, a class once a week, twice a week? But if you can study what you want to learn every single day, Look how much further you are ahead. And look at the people out there who have been able to do that. Take um, Bill Gates, who didn't make his father happy by leaving Harvard, but his father knew that there was a spark in him that was going to come up with something different. They didn't make IBM and Xerox, all the guys that were working with him, happy when they left, but they knew that those people weren't looking forward. They weren't paying attention. They didn't have mentors. Even though they were you know, C-suite and high-end tech and all this, they didn't have mentors that they paid attention to. These guys took a look at the negatives and found other people that were mentors to them that they could work with. Wolfsniak became a mentor. Like with, with um, I, I mentioned uh, Nolan Bushnell being a mentor to Steve Jobs. They're teaching him how to drive hard and create something that was excellent. Sure. Sure. Regarding mentorship, <clears throat> how, how did you, in your experience, what, what has been the most effective in finding a mentor that will, that will teach you what, you what you want to learn? Did you, is it sort of, you always stumble upon them, or I mean, how do you seek them out? So with my, all my strange connections, the, the Bruce Stoller, that was just happened. I just happened to go get a hot dog. That was just happened to us. But the important thing about that, I think, is first, being comfortable in your own skin. You don't have to be ultra confident, but you've got to be sure of something. You've got to be sure of something about yourself. What are you selling? You know? And I think that puts that energy out that people pay attention to. Another <coughs> person that was a mentor to me, I've, I've done, um, with Hyperloop, I, I did some voice work for them, um, and I've done some other voice work for other companies. Um, Gentlemen, you hear that voice in a world or so and so. That guy named Don LaFontaine was like a dad to me. Um, and I met him again doing music. I was playing at a very high end restaurant in Los Angeles, Edge of the Hills. And I was singing. And he got up and he put a $50 bill in front of me and says, Now do it like you mean it. And he said it loud enough for everybody to be hearing, I'm like, Crap, who is this guy? And we became very good friends. 
and he taught me all about that side of that business, doing voiceover, being a, there's being an announcer, and there's actually being a pronouncer. They actually use that term, um, about engineering voice. So I learned more things about audio physics um, from him, and as a result of him. So that was another one where I just paid attention to somebody who came to me. The other way to get a mentor is to actually seek out somebody in the field that you want to uh, pursue. It's not as hard as you think. All that can happen is somebody can say no. You have some crabby people. I remember an architectural student doing an interview and talking about trying to get with Neutra, who's quite a famous architect. And he found where he lived. He knocked on his door. The guy opened the door. He says, I would like to. And Neutra slammed the door in his face. He tried it again a week later. He slammed the door in his face. So he gave it up. He went and found somebody else. Um, so all they can do is say no. And they're not going to be the only person. Here's something that's important about that story with Neutra. Neutra's architecture stopped at a certain point. Okay? His creativity didn't continue forward. He had an iconic style, and people still love his houses. They look for it, but it stopped. As somebody who can mentor, if you don't take people on, you stop learning. Okay? I teach. I've tended to teach young kids up to just prior to university. Then I help them get into different universities. Whenever I'm teaching, I have them teach me. I will give them lessons and I go, okay, here, teach me. I don't know a thing. I'm going to ask you the dumbest questions on the, on the planet you're going, to, you're going to have to answer them for. And I drill them and I have them teach me. So as a mentor, you make yourself bigger and better by having people come to you and ask you for help. So remember that about the people that you look for. If they are reticent, if you can open them up, that's great. You'll learn a lot from them, and they'll be happy because they'll be learning a lot from you. And they'll appreciate that. But if they keep shutting you off, go find somebody else. Okay? You're lucky here at Berkeley. When you say you see Berkeley, people perk up. When, when you talk to business people, you say, I'm at UC Berkeley, they go, oh. You know? And let me tell you, Last project I was on, I was using interns from USC, and I didn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> I got here, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so much fun. People really are engaged, and they know what they're doing, and they want to be here. Um, that project was a manufacturing project, another one that I'm in the middle of now. And we're dealing with patents, and international patents, and um, Brexit has just cost us another $80,000, you know, all this different stuff. But again, I learned a lot of good things from a lot of good mentors. Um, so I just continue forward. Any other questions? I just keep moving. Um, what else can I tell you? I've had, I've had a very speckled life because I've wanted that. I didn't want to stay in one place at any one time. I've been on television more than any other pianist in the past 10 years. And I'm always there playing music. You know, you see me in NCIS, you see me in Agent Carter, you catch me, who's that guy over there, and all that other stuff. I have a lot of fun with it. Um, I call it mailbox money, because I, you know, as, as a musician at that level, you get royalties on every TV show you do in every region. And it dissipates, but I've done enough that the checks are nice. So, um, the manufacturing, the writing. I was the membership director for the Wiesenthal Center for a year because I just wanted to do it. I thought that was important work, so I signed up and, and with a recruiter and they had that job and came up. And said, Great, this is what I'm looking for. And I went for that and spent a year at that. That wasn't going to be my career, but I knew I could take a year out of my life to contribute to a cause that was anti-violence, that was about educating people around the globe. So I did that. I got to work with Rabbi Heyer and Rabbi May. It was uh, the time when Clinton was president, so I was on a few calls with President Clinton. I got a chance to listen and, and, and help shape some ideas. And that feels good. When you, can, when you can take from your mentors these ideas and internalize them and then go out and find something to do, even if it's temporary, where you can help shape ideas that benefit other people, it's empowering. 
it, you gain a lot of confidence from that. That's one of the reason that, reasons that they always say volunteer. Now, for me, that was a paid position. It was a year. So you find something to volunteer. And that's another key thing in, in, in being entrepreneurial. Find a place. If it's the National Park Service, if it's, I don't know, whatever it is, volunteer. But really do something. You know, some people go, oh, I volunteered in such and such, and they had to show up for two days during a week for one hour, and they sat at a desk and they pushed some papers around. Find purpose in that. If you're pushing papers around, who benefits from that? You know? Find something to do where somebody really benefits, where you can see the results of your work. Volunteer. Find your value. Find how all the ideas that you've learned meld into something different, something that you didn't think they would meld into. Something to contribute to a path you didn't think they would be useful for. Find a way to do that. Okay? Um, another little, this is a cautionary tale. Right after that, I wanted to still do some finance work. I wanted to work in some corporations. I didn't want, to, I didn't want it to be permanent, but I wanted to test what I knew. There was a company called Towers Parent. It's now, as I wrote the name down, it's changed their name. Towers of Watson now. They did the banking system for Hughes. Uh, they did uh, Freightliner and, and Greyhound, which took care of a lot of things for, for companies that wanted to start sort of their own union, if you will. And they did it for other unions. They did financial um, analysis for large corporations. I had learned from Mr. Stoller a lot about arbitrage. International banking. What is a PBM? What is a DLC? How do you go in and get a DLC and buy PBMs from Bank of Spain and then take those PBMs and trade them with prime bank notes? DLC is a documentary, documentary letter of credit. Um, and I don't know if any of you have studied some of what went on during the, the crash. You remember there was a, a French gentleman that they tried to put in prison, they didn't quite get him. There was a gentleman from India that they did put in prison. Um, and I thought that was kind of unfair. But I learned how to do those tricks. I learned all about that. And while I, when I was at Towers Parent, some folks were taking the actual actuarial test. And I heard one guy say, well, why would you want to do it? It was something about trade and, and, and having something at one price and getting it at another price. And why would you want to get it down here? I said, because then you could go and blah, 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 blah. They go, how did you know that? I was let go from Towers Parent about a week later because I wasn't supposed to know that stuff. Um, and that taught me another very important thing. Be careful sharing what you know. Just be cautious. Okay. When you can surprise somebody, when there's really the need for a solution, that's the perfect time to tell somebody what they need to know, if you know it. But don't volunteer stuff beyond what you should. If you're in control, different. If you're part of the ownership of the company, different. But there's even a caution there. If you're dealing with venture capitalists, you don't want to tell them everything. You want to keep stuff hidden over here. So be careful how you speak and what you speak of. Have your path. Be discreet is probably the best description I can give you. Be discreet. Okay? Um, <clears throat> So he was telling you some of where I've been recently. The, with Hyperloop transportation technologies, um, there's a lot of controversy around building this transportation system. And my job as communications director was simply to tell them, it's easy. You take a maglev train, you take the wings and tail off a jet, you put people inside, you put magnets on it, and you run it down the track. And it sounds silly, but Again, it's how do you message, how do you sell something, how do you construct an image so simple that they will let the scientists figure out how to make it perfect, but people will believe it, okay? What is your elevator pitch? How are you going to talk to somebody? Whether you're working for a company or starting your own, if you're talking to a venture capitalist, if you're trying to find partners, the guy that I'm working with on this, on this manufacturing project, um, He's from Sweden. He was one of the good USC students. He graduated. I know I'm sounding terrible. <laughs> he, when we 
talk about money, you let him go get the money. Because he's got that confidence. He knows how to talk. So you know what? We need an infusion of another fifty thousand dollars, or we're gonna have to move some things around. No problem. Two days later, have another one this Okay. He's got the confidence to sell the idea. But most importantly, he's selling himself. People have confidence in him. Even when I don't think he can do it, I'm dude, come with So no, 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 I'll be okay. He has enough confidence in himself. The other thing which I don't see a lot of, unfortunately, in business today, is honesty. You see some corporations putting a truth officer in their C-suite, um, and some of it's just for show. Those people will come and go, because they're really working hard to make sure that, that there's veracity at the first edge of the public-facing part of the company. It's not always there. Very frequently, it's not. I mean, look. Everybody says, don't get into politics, but let's be honest. My company that I had EAC that he mentioned, I took that company in a number of different directions that I described to you through these different consultancies. One of the places I took it was into large events. I wanted to do something big, something fun. I could do all my marketing and messaging through that. So I did a Super Bowl, I did a World Championship of Golf, I did a Melvin John concert. I also worked for Donald Trump. I never took a check from him because I knew something was going to go wrong if I did. But I watched a situation where people weren't honest. They were doing the right things. They were following the right rules business-wise. But personally, they weren't honest. And that can be OK. I mean, some people are all right with living that way. I'm not. And I think the best business people are not either. Um, we could probably go through a list of, of folks that you admire, that you know about, that run certain companies. And I'll guarantee you the companies that are doing well, the companies that seem to have the future, have people in control who are honest. Don't tell stories. Don't exaggerate. Put your own confidence on them. Learn how to let that emanate and sell that. If you're, if you're going in, give me some, something a super. What, what, what do you want to do when you're out of here? What is your path? What do you think your path is at the moment? Me? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go to grad school. Okay. Yeah. Where are you going to go? Uh, Georgetown in D.C. Wonderful. I was Jesuit trained, so... <laughs> um, what is your field of study? Law. Okay. When you're done with that, what do you want to do? Uh, I'm from New Zealand, so I'll go back to New Zealand and work there in environmental law. Very cool. Do you see situations that need you? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Like, there's so many environmental problems in New Zealand and around the world, so. They keep you focused. Law is really funny. Um, where you compartmentalize. Especially if you're if you're a trial lawyer, there are times when you have to put the truth out of your head. You have to stand dealing with facts. This is what we know, and the good ones roll out the truth bit by bit, and they stop. You challenge the other side to finish it. If you can't finish it, this is where we are. I win my case. Okay, but it's still about being truthful. It's still about integrity, and those who have integrity will live better, their health will be better, they'll live longer, they'll have better business. They'll have more business choices, better choices, than those that are not necessarily the people, not running with the okay. um, With the Hyperloop, we got into a position where we need to start building uh, capsules to make this thing real. And they decided they were going to cut some people. And I was one of the ones that got cut. I had plenty of stock in the company, and ownership in the company. But I wasn't making a wage. I had a couple things. I could take my company. I had started with them as a contractor with my corporation. Then I had let my corporation sort of go to sleep. I could start that back up and go running hard. And I said, you know what? No. Let me do something else. I had been coming up here for quite a while. And 
I got involved with the Berkeley Food Institute just as, a, as a, you know, an observer. I mean, to me, it's important that communities have autonomy, how to get their food and where to get their food. And I found a group of people up here who were studying that. And I got a random email. And I don't know if somebody knew and sent it to me. I had stayed in touch with Elsevig, you know, with the Haas Institute. So do any of you know him? Um, and we had talked a bit, and there were a couple of authors that I recommended that come here, and they took it on. And so some pretty decent authors are coming here to speak as a result of my efforts. Um, but at that point, I said, with this random email, this is interesting. Let me go back and do what I did before when I was at the Leasing Fall Center. Let me take, get a contract, and come in here and see if I can do it. I've got some time. I'm not tied down. So I did that. For some of you, it'll be different. You'll be married. You'll have kids. Um, maybe some of you will have parents that you're looking after or another relative. Um, life throws us some funny things that we have to take and be happy with. You get joy out of being able to assist someone else, even if that creates some stasis in our lives. But still find a way to help, even outside of that home spot. Find a way to go outside and help. And that's what I did coming here. So this is kind of the, you're seeing me kind of at the end of all this stuff that I've spoken of, um, working with the Berkeley Food Institute, figuring out how to take all these scientists that we interface with, people from, from this school, from the law school, I sat and talked to Saru about Saru Jairaman about what she's doing. How do I help all these people tell their story in a better way? Or how do when they tell their story well, how do I help them spread it even more? So that's where I am right now in my career. I hope I not fooled you. <laughs> we, we probably have time for a few questions. I have one about the music industry. I, I, I'm just I'm interested uh, in this kind of era of so many people being able to record high, uh, high quality music, post it on SoundCloud, YouTube, uh, whatever. Uh, how, what do you think differentiates those artists that are able then to make a living with music and you know, the 99% that, that don't? Okay, first of all, let's talk about technical. Um, music is mixed for this device. Okay. When you listen to the music that's mixed for this device on a large system, it doesn't sound good. So the first thing is to know your audience and what they're going to listen to. Okay. Um, the second thing that I always talk to is, I, I do still teach music. I do still teach the business of music every now and then. I have a couple seminars that I run probably every other year for the summer. Um, music is like building houses. It's real estate. You write a song, now instead of having to get a developer, you can go do the song yourself. You can build your own house. Basically. And when you build your own house, you can now Bring people to it, so he wants to buy this house. Ryan Tedder, and you guys know that name, right? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. So, he's written a lot of songs for Adele. There's, <coughs> there's a lot of pop music out there that he's written. You don't know it's him. But Ryan is one of those people who writes and writes and writes. And he goes and sells the house. Treat Those people that are successful have treated music like real estate. They've gotten all the right paperwork done. They've done all the right work. The roof is on correctly. The door slams properly. The windows are in place. And then they go sell that real estate. So the other side of it is what I mentioned earlier. Understanding yourself so you know how to market yourself. Understanding your product and having you, having that product dominate from you. Understanding how to sell that product. So those are literally, those are the only elements between somebody who's successful and somebody who's not. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. And uh, the sign-in sheet, if you haven't got to it, is right there. And also, Billy's running for ASU Senate, guys, so take a look.